Well, good morning. You know, as we have been, I made the analogy last week that studying the Trinity, talking through the Trinity can feel like you're in concrete. And if you look at how many verses we've covered over the past couple of weeks as we've been talking to, uh, through it, it may really seem like we are stuck in concrete. Today we're going to move a couple verses forward. But the reason why we've taken so long to begin this conversation talking through what it means that our God is three in one is because this was the claim that drastically changed the Jewish people's understanding of who God was. And whether or not they believed it led to them either becoming part of the sect known as Christians or staying in kind of the settled path that had been Judaism before it. And today, as we move forward, we're going to continue this conversation walking through what Jesus revealed about who He is, who the Father is, and who the Spirit is. But first, I want to just kind of explain what these two things are up here on stage. You may have seen me using them over the past couple of weeks as I've referenced to them during sermons at certain points. This is based off of a very old uh, diagram called the Trinitarian Shield, which is a way of explaining what it means that God is three in one. And so for those of you on the wings, you won't be able to see it. But what it is, this is referring to God. When we refer to the name God just in general, All of this consists of God as he really is. And so what we see in the Old Testament, you have the Father who's revealed to be the God. And we talk about him as Father in the Old Testament, the Israelites do. And there's all the things that we talked through a couple of weeks ago that are characteristics of who God is. God is one. There's no other God. God is creator. He made the world. He created it. He gives life to it. God is the source of life. God is all good. He is all powerful. He is all knowledgeable. He is all present. He's everywhere in the world. There's nowhere you can go to flee from him or get away from him. God is going to be the judge of the world, and all deeds will be repaid either according to how they deserve to be repaid, or based on the merit of, as we know, Christ. God is eternal. He doesn't have a beginning or an end. God is not physical. God is unique. He's not like us. There is no other God like Him. God reveals who He is, and God does not change. Now, if you missed the sermon where we went through all of that, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. The reason why is because that's the cultural like quicksand that Jesus is stepping into when we get to John chapter 5. That's their understanding of God, is all of these characteristics and qualities. And then comes along a man, which is what the cross represents, the man Jesus Christ, who it would not be appropriate to say, has no beginning because we know his beginning. As a man, he had a beginning. The supernatural birth, he started somewhere. He's not all present. They could see him in one place at one time. There are things, these qualities about who God is that it's not appropriate to say about Jesus the man. And so, I remember this uh, story about, um, our, well, there was this video that this youth pastor made for his students when they were going to camp that was talking about there are pink areas and there are blue areas. If you know, have ever been a volunteer on a youth camp, you know that one of the constant struggles is keeping the boys and the girls in appropriate areas. And so he said there are pink areas and there are blue areas. Don't make purple. <laughs> there are not purple areas for you to commingle. There are blue areas. There are pink areas. When we're talking about what Jesus has revealed to us, 
that the Son is God. All of these things we just said are appropriate to say about the Son in His divinity as He's God. They are not appropriate to say about His humanity. So when we're talking about the Son, understanding this, that thing has a mind of its own, (laughs) understanding this helps us to kind of decipher what Jesus is saying, where he's saying things about himself, like, as we read last week, that the Son has life in himself, or we're going to read today, too, There's things like that that's appropriate to say about the Son in His divinity. As the Son is God, it's not appropriate to say about His humanity. Let me give you one quick example that will help this make a lot more sense. God died for my sins. When we say that, we have to be clear. What we mean is Jesus Christ, who is both God and man, died in his humanity. We do not mean by that God died for our sins. Because if God died, he ceased to exist, everything else would cease to exist. So there's helpful ways. This is a tool that I have up here as we're having that conversation. So when you see me walk over here and I'm pointing to this, I'm usually talking about something that is referring to the divinity of Christ. It's talking about him as he's God. And when I walk over here, I'm talking about something that refers to his humanity. Because Jesus, and what John records with this speech of Jesus's, there's a lot of depth in what Jesus is revealing. He's causing us to have to wrestle with and grapple with this truth he's revealing about who God is from eternity past and the fact that that God has come to us. And how do we make sense of that? How do we think through it? And so we get to sit on the shoulders of giants in our Christian faith who for hundreds of years spent a tremendous amount of time thinking through how to properly talk about this. For example, in developing this diagram, the Trinitarian shield, to think through this. In this, the Son is God. The Father is God. The Spirit is God. But the Spirit is not the Father. The Son is not the Spirit. The Father is not the Son. There's three in one. All God. So when we think through, for example, this is something that's really helpful for this, just a practical tidbit. When we think about Jesus going to the cross and suffering the wrath of God, we think about Jesus going to the cross. He is suffering the wrath of Father Son, and Spirit. It's not an angry, tyrant father who's committing the equivalent of divine child abuse on his son because he's angry about sin, and so he's going to punish. The son is suffering his own wrath towards sin as well. This wasn't an unwilling participant. This was the Son of God saying, I will take on human flesh, and I will suffer the divine wrath, all of us together pouring out our wrath on sin so that they won't have to if they'll believe in me. So, keeping this in mind, because we're going to continue using it just to help us make sense of what we're going through, we're going to continue ahead. John chapter 5, verse 24. Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he has granted to the Son to have life in himself. The first thing I want us to see this morning 
from this passage is God is knowable. God is knowable. In chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word, Jesus is talking about him speaking what he has learned to be true. As a man, he grew, he learned, he matured, and he spoke what he learned from scriptures and from relying on being filled with the Holy Spirit. He is speaking what is true about who God is. Anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me will have eternal life. Jesus makes this connection between him in his humanity speaking about who God is and it actually teaching us something true about who God is. There's this You know, we talked about God is unique. He's not like us. He's different than us. God even says so. My ways are not, your ways are not my ways, and your thoughts are not my thoughts. His thoughts are higher and above ours and beyond ours. We don't even have a way to really make him like us. Has it ever occurred to you, for example, that nothing has ever occurred to God? He never had any type of realization. There was no point where God was like, oh, that's a good point. (laughs) He's always known every point. It's even when we pray. We don't pray to him because he needs to be informed about what we need. In fact, in Matthew 5, it tells us he already knows our requests, so keep our words few. The uniqueness of God, him being entirely different than us, can be something that can be startling because we start to think, well, I have a hard enough time understanding people who are different than me. I can't understand, I can't even fathom what it's like, what goes on in the brain activity of my dog or things that are different than me in this world. How in the world can I possibly understand God? who's above and beyond and infinitely more complex than anything I see here. How can I know him? And we can have this, it can weigh on you, and there are people who just say, well, there is no way for us to truly know him. You may have heard the term deist. There are people who believe that there is a God, but that we don't have a sure way of knowing him or understanding him. You can have the view that God is kind of like this grand clockmaker who made the world, wound it up, set it in motion, and then step back and just watches. That there's no personal connection between him and his creation, but that he's distant and far off. And in that sentence that we just read from Jesus, Jesus shows us In what he is revealing to us, God is basically knowable. He is able, we have the ability, when we are not being warped by sin, to understand God. He said, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life. There's a direct connection between the words Jesus is uttering and actual knowledge being passed on from the one who sent him. Jesus assumes it's the case. You can know God. You're not eternally separated from him. He's not unknowable and out of reach and impersonable. He is near us. In fact, He has taken on flesh to stand among you. This is God making himself known. Remember, one of the attributes we talked about is he reveals himself to us. We also talked about he is our creator. Now, it would be an entire lapse of ability for him to make creatures that are intended to have a relationship with him, but had no ability to to understand him at all. And so, the basic assumption, he is our creator, 
who made us to commune with him, to have a relationship with him, to know him and to be known by him. And you may say, where is that at? Well, when John says, whoever believes, hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. We're going to read in a second from John 17, 3, where Jesus says, this is eternal life to know the Father, and to know the Son whom He has sent. Eternal life is for you to know God. And it's basic. It's not for you to escape punishment. We were not made to be lost and then found. We were made to know Him and then got lost. And he came to restore us to that. We were made to walk in the garden with him in the cool of the day. We were made to hear his voice. We were made to know him and to experience this wonderful creator who can speak and nothing responds and becomes something. We were made to know him. This is eternal life. To know the Father and to know the Son who He sent. So when Jesus is speaking here and says, Whoever hears my word and believes Him who sent me has eternal life, He's making the point God is knowable. And we were made to know Him. God, as Creator, even expects this of us. This is part of what it means to have faith, is to believe that he's knowable and that he draws near to those who seek him. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must also believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. See, God is not like some impersonable force that's operating in this world. He's not like the laws of gravity that we go and we study and we find out and it's never reaching back to us but it's just there for us to study and perform uh, experiments and test on until we are able to use the data to kind of explain it god himself when we seek to draw near to him faith means we believe that he reaches back he wants to be with us He wants us to know Him. It's why we were made. The purpose of our lives was to know God, to be shaped by Him and changed by Him. And this isn't something just like how, even if we stop there, we could still say, well, I reach out to God and He reaches back to me and I learn things about Him and it stops there. But knowledge, true belief, like what is talked about in Scripture, it doesn't stop at head knowledge. It's not learning the facts to go and ace the test. It is an experiential relationship with a person. If you want to know someone, I'll use men for example, one of the best ways that men form relationships and bond is by accomplishing some task together. Go out and work on some project. Cut some trees down. Do whatever it is, but you work together. You sweat together. You see what people do when they get frustrated together. You joke and you play around and you form a relationship because you're actually experiencing what it's like to walk with this person. So when Jesus speaks about us knowing the Father, us hearing Jesus' word and then believing that belief right there, It's hearing and then going to your heart to where you start to walk into it. You start to put faith in it. You have faith that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So what does this look like? First off, you have what Jesus is talking about, who hear my word. It's a type of learned knowledge. Jesus even calls the Pharisees out for this as being good practitioners of this but not good people who lived it out. They studied scripture, for example. They sought head knowledge as much as they possibly could. 
John 5, 39 says, you pour over the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And yet they testify about me. But you were not willing to come to me so that you may have life. This is something to consider with the Pharisees. They had the head knowledge in a sense. They studied the scriptures, yet their hearts were not softened and willing to receive. It was about being able to say, I know the scriptures. I tithe my mint and my cumin. I mean, just imagine that. Imagine if before you came to church on Sunday morning, you went to your spice rack or your spice box, or whatever it is you keep your spices in, and you weighed out each individual spice, and then you took a tenth of it, and you brought that and gave it to church. He's saying, look, you, you use all of these standards, you have all this head knowledge of where you can give all of these right justifications for how you're following God more faithfully, how you're doing things appropriately. Yet when the true test of the matter comes which is, is your heart willing to receive me? You walk away. You're unwilling to come to me. They had to learn knowledge. They heard the word. But it never actually transformed them to pursue the relationship. It wasn't about knowing God. It was about knowing. And we have to be concerned about that. As people who study God's Word, are we studying God's Word for what end? What purpose? Because we do not worship the Bible. The Bible is not the center thing of our faith. Jesus is. It is a person that we are called to come to. It is a person that we are seeking. The Bible is a way He has given us, reliable and trustworthy, to help us know Him, to come to Him, to worship Him. So when we hear this, is it stopping at learned knowledge? Is it stopping just at head knowledge? I know the facts. I know who Jesus is. I know what He did. I know the events of His life. I know the right things to say about God, so that if you gave me a test on some Trinitarian shield, I'd be able to pass it. I know those things, but if it stops there, it doesn't give life. It doesn't actually help us grow into what God intended for us to be, which were people who knew Him in a relational way. The second thing, second part of true knowledge is lived Knowledge. Romans 1.20 says, For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. There is enough evidence in this world for us to see the beautiful hand of God in it. We have all already been blessed by it this morning. Someone went out and found pieces of wood and metal and adjusted them and manipulated them until they took the form and shape of a piano to where when you would press a key, beautiful notes would come out of it. Beautiful notes that were written in the chord charts of God's handbook. That he designed. He's the one who makes music beautiful, sunrises, beautiful, forest, beautiful, birds, beautiful. He's the one who has adorned this world so that when we go out and in the middle of the night when no lights are on near us can look up and see galaxies decorating and hanging in the sky. His presence, His eternal presence Power and divine nature, as Paul said, are clearly visible to us. But we don't do anything about it. It, does, it can't stop at just this recognition of seeing those things. John, 1 John 2, 4 says, The one who says, I have come to know him, and yet doesn't keep his commands, is a liar. 
and the truth is not in him. See, learned and lived knowledge together are what make true knowledge. Jesus demonstrated this to us in his humanity, where he would go to the synagogue to study the scriptures, where he would sit down on the steps and ask, converse, ask questions and engage with religious leaders, where Hebrews tells us that he learned obedience through suffering. You know what it means to learn obedience through suffering? It is when you are learning truths about what it means to follow God, but it's going to be painful for you to actually trust it and live it out. But you decide, I believe God more than I'm afraid of what I will lose or suffer or endure. And so you walk out, you live that knowledge. It doesn't just stop in like learning it with your head. It actually guides you and shapes your life. Jesus demonstrated that. Think about him in the garden. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. He demonstrated how humans were made to learn about God through reading His Word, through prayer, through times of meditation and solitude, and then practically live it out in your life. And you know what happens in those moments? This is part of what I think that that verse about what faith is, is faith is the belief that God exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. When you move from that point of saying, I've learned what I should be doing, and it's really going to be difficult and painful to actually live that way. And when you take that step, that's where you are believing God rewards those who seek Him. And He rewards you by meeting you in that moment. He rewards you by giving you Himself by actually walking with you through that difficult journey of changing your life to be more of what it's intended to be. It's not a journey you take on your own. Faith, walking in obedience as Christ did, learning that through suffering, the suffering of dying to yourself and dying to the things of this world and believing God is worth more than all of them. That's where we see God guiding us, walking us, meeting with us. Where when you're in those moments like Paul, where he's in prison, and yet he's singing and rejoicing because his God is with him there. Those are the types, that is true knowledge. That is knowledge that's not just textbook knowledge. That is lived knowledge where you have the experience of walking with Christ where you have the experience of seeing that our God is knowable and He wants to be known by you. He wants you to walk with Him and to experience Him. It's what you were made for. And some of us in this room have walked many, many, many miles with God. We've seen Him prove Himself faithful over and over and over again in incredible ways. Some of us have only started that journey. And we're beginning to take those steps of following Christ, following God. And it's difficult. But here's what we're called to. As you take that first step, God gives you that call to something that you need to be obedient to. That it's challenging and it's difficult for you. And it seems like, how in the world can I do this? What you can rest assured of is he'll meet you in that moment and you have all you need to make that step. If you're young in your faith, it may be very simple things. Very simple ways in which you acknowledge that you're a Christian to friends or you're willing to kind of say, this is who I am and own it. It may be the first time that you ever share the gospel with someone. But you say, I'm going to be obedient, and you take that step. And just like anything where you grow and mature and get more capable, the more you do it, the more you walk with God, the more your faith is going to grow. Because when he asks you to take bigger and bigger steps, and then you finally get to that part where you can't see the ground your foot's going to land on, he's proven himself faithful. How would he drop you now? 
Faith is seeking God and trusting he rewards those who genuinely do. The moment your faith stops growing is the moment you pull your foot back. The moment your faith stops growing is the moment that you trust that the circumstances and your understanding of them is more reliable than the God who has sustained you up until that point. But in the kindness of God, in the graciousness of God, even when we fail, even when we fail those tests, we don't choose to walk with him faithfully. The next step can be, again, a step acting in faith. You don't have to run in circles. Because God's desire in this world is not to be a wrathful God that punishes. His desire is not to bring about your, what you deserve on you. His desire is for you to know him. And there are times that it will go through times of discipline and difficulty. But his heart is always one of wanting you with him. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. When you are learning a new job or something, any type of skill, the way that you learn it is by getting boots on the ground and seeking to actually do it, by making mistakes, by stumbling. But you learn through that experience. You learn to trust the wisdom of your coach or the wisdom of your boss. You learn to trust that what they're saying gets the result that it's intended to. And with God, we have to learn to trust Him as He guides us, as He teaches us about Himself. That walking in faith, throwing away sin, which bars us from knowing him, and instead walking in what he's revealed to us, helps us to know him, to know him more fully. The second thing, Jesus shows us eternal life is attainable. You could look at our situation and think how hopeless it was that this was what God made us for and yet we lost it. But Jesus revealed, Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and has not come under judgment but has passed from death to life. Truly I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. What is eternal life? John 17, 3. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the one true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. Again, it's about us knowing him. It's about us experiencing God himself and learning to love him. But here's the thing. Point number three. That was a really short point. <laughs> point number three. Jesus' life shows us our deepest desire is infinite. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus said, For just as the Father had life in himself, so he granted to the Son to have life in himself. God has life. God has, as eternal life has been said for us, it's knowledge of God. It's knowing him experientially. It's walking with him having a relationship with Him, knowing God. It's why when we think about heaven, heaven would not be heaven if it wasn't for the fact that God was there. That it's a place for us to know God and experience Him. And so, Jesus revealing to us God Himself is the source of all life, which we studied about in the Old Testament, that the Son has this life in himself, and that by believing this message, we get to experience eternal life. We get to experience the unending knowledge of a relationship with God. 
What we're made for is to know God, and the source of that knowledge never runs dry. It's like, have you ever had some kind of present or some kind of trip or whatever it is that you couldn't wait for? You were so excited for it. You knew that your kids are getting you a new car. You knew that you're about to go on a cruise. You knew maybe it's much more simple things. Your husband's getting you a vacuum cleaner. (laughs) Whatever it is, you were like, I can't wait for this. And you think about it and you dream about it. I mean, if I go into my girl's room right now, there are Lego sets taped on the wall of things that Rayleigh's like, I want this Lego set. It's like a veterinary clinic. And she like, well, several times I said, Daddy, I have something I want to show you. And she'll take me in there and be like, I really want this set. And I'm like, I've seen that set a couple times now. I know you want it. But she's thinking about it. She's dreaming about it. She's got it taped on the wall above her bed. And yet, I bet if I got her that set, after a couple of weeks of playing with it, it will wind up like every other Lego set in a bucket by itself, unplayed with. We have these desires. We have these things that we love and that we want and that we're looking forward to, and we get them, and there's some really good moments with them, but they never satisfy us. I have never heard of someone saying, I got a Lego set and I was satisfied the rest of my life. (laughs) Neither a car, nor a trip, nor a house, nor a boat, nor a plane, nor a building, nor whatever else. All of these things, we get them and they give us a couple minutes of delight and then they become the norm, mundane. We were made to know God. Life, eternal life, is the knowledge of that God who made all things. That God is the source of all life himself. He's given life to everything in this creation. But he himself is life. Unlimited, undefined, total, pure life. Knowledge of God. What this means for us is God is not like any of those things that we've gotten, that we experience for a time, and we become bored of. Whether in this life right now, if you are bored of God, it is not because the well of life that is knowing God has run dry. It is because you have become infatuated with things that are lesser. Because you're seeking for those things to be what satisfy you and give you your purpose and your joy. Because you've bought into the lie that God is just this vague name that we talk about when we get together on Sunday morning. or that There's no real meaning behind it. It's just kind of all Christians have some kind of religion. All people generally have some kind of religion. And God is just the thing we refer to that ominous thing outside of us that helps us when we need him and not that he's someone for us to know someone that we were made to know the very purpose for mine and your life is to know him to know him in a way that radically shapes our life and transforms us into people who make others know about him to be so transformed in our inner being and in the way that we conduct ourselves that when people see us, there's some ring of familiarity that what they see in our lives reminds them of something they long for, which is Him. That they see His Spirit walking in us and the fruits of the Spirit adorning our lives, and it gives them some kind of desire for that because it's Him. The gospel is a gospel message about us finally being restored to knowing who we were made to know. And we will spend an eternity searching out the depths of who our God is and never exhaust them. Every time we learn something new about God, there will be a greater depth to plunder. It's like when you are out on the ocean and you step up to the edge of the boat and look down 
You can see a little ways down before the light no longer penetrates the water. You can tell that the water's deep, but you can't see the depth. And that's what it's like when we truly are buying in and truly saying, I want to know Him, to be known by Him, to walk with Him. No matter how deep you drive out into the ocean, you can always see that it is deep, but you can never see how deep it truly goes. And that's what it's like to walk with God. But it's not something that just has to wait until we get to heaven. In fact, those who are experiencing it in heaven are those who longed for it in this life. Those who said, I want to know him. To be changed by him. To be shaped by him. Because he is good and lovely and the source of all beauty that I see in this world. I have searched the world and it doesn't fill me. There's nothing better than him. And I want him. I want to know him. And because of what Jesus revealed to us, we know that we can. I know that you can know God now. It doesn't have to wait. You can know him and experience what it's like to walk with him to take each step of obedience and find that your loving Father meets you there. He does not abandon you or walk away. He's not impersonable, standing back, just watching you struggle through life. But He'll come along with you and He'll help you and sustain you. That He will give you the endurance to persevere. That He's willing to bear your burdens with you which is what is profoundly demonstrated in Jesus. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him can know God and be known by Him. That's what John 3.16 says. Your eternal life is in knowing this God and walking with Him daily and finding that He is who He has always said He is. And so, if you don't know Him, if you've never made that decision of you want to follow Him and you want to know Him, come talk to me. I would love to tell you about it. And just start to walk through that process of what it looks like to know God and walk with Him. Because I can promise you there are going to be times that you're going to falter and you're going to stumble. And that's why God puts us together so that we can come alongside each other and say, look, you're buying into a lie that this other thing is more desirable than knowing and walking with God. And I want more for you than that. I know you're discouraged right now, but I will come alongside you and support you. Why? Because I want you to know my God. And I want you to know him more. I know that what you're going through is really difficult and you have no idea how to make sense of it. How could you think, how could God allow this to happen? Well, let me comfort you with the same comfort God gave me in a similar situation. Why? Because I don't want you to be overwhelmed by this and walk away from knowing who you were made to know. I want you to see him and love him and be known by him. And so if you're interested in that, I want to invite you to come talk to me. This God is worth everything in our life. He is someone that when those who seek Him truly step in faith on it, they're never disappointed. Father God, give us strength. Give us wisdom. Help us to know You and to be known by You. This is what we were made for. Amen.